Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Another key assumption, or if you like, explicit doctrine, of St. Anselm's metaphysical perspective that plays a very important role in the Monologium and in other works is what we can call the doctrine of degrees of being. And like I put here, this is an important Platonist or Neoplatonist doctrine. You're going to find it not only in you know, you know, Christian Platonists such as Anselm and his predecessors uh, like Boethius or St. Augustine, you're also going to find it in, in other Platonist philosophers, including um, those who are you know, pagans like um, uh, Plotinus and, and his students. You're going to find this in, in Neoplatonism in, in general, this idea that there are degrees or levels of being. Um, not just, you, know, might, you might say, more and less in the sense of having more or less of a quality, but more and less in terms of actual being. This is a, an idea that has been largely rejected, although sometimes it gets smuggled back in in different ways in modern thought. And so it's worth dwelling on it a bit as you're approaching Anselm's text, not so that you necessarily become convinced of it, that's not the goal in, in trying to, to make sense of it, but uh, so that you can understand Anselm's perspective more adequately and see how his argumentation is supposed to work. You know, it's one thing to say, I reject him altogether, and it's all nonsense. It's another to say, well, I find this assumption questionable, but I do see how what he's saying would follow if you grant that assumption. And so that's something that's open to you if you do indeed understand the doctrine. Now, um, <clears throat> like I put here, one way to understand this is the assertion that there are fundamentally different basic types of beings that are on different levels ontologically or, or metaphysically. They have more or less being. And Anselm will also talk about them as having greater or lesser dignity. So this is worth dwelling on for, for a moment. What do we mean by having more or less being? You might say, I have no clue about what that's supposed to translate into. Um, having more or less being is literally what, it, what it's saying, that there are some beings that don't really exist in the same way or to the same degree as higher beings who actually have greater existence, and then there might be levels higher and higher. There's, there's sort of a fullness. Um, you could think about this in terms of, you know, um, parts and wholes, if you like. Um, it's not necessarily saying that, like, society has greater existence than human beings. Anselm is not committed to anything like that. But um, we often want to reduce things to their basic components and say, well, the basic components are what's most real, and you put them together in certain ways, and then somehow you get life, right? Or you put living things together in certain ways, and suddenly you get sentience. And, and those are just sort of, you know, epiphenomena or supervening things, or whatever you want to say. The Platonist viewpoint, instead of saying um, we, we begin from building on the bottom and then go up, begins at the top and goes downward and says, as we get further and further away from the top, we're dealing with things that really exist less. They, they don't have the same degree or the same intensity, you might say, of being as higher levels do. So a very fascinating way of looking at things. If you do look at things in that way, there's a kind of um, a sort of unfolding or reversal that takes place in your perspective. 
Now, there's two places in the monologian where Anselm very explicitly invokes this doctrine. Um, one is in chapter 4 where he's using uh, one kind of example. And then there's chapter 31 where he uses another kind of example. Um, 31 is a little bit more developed, so we'll look at that one second. Uh, but there's some interesting structural features that are the same in both cases. Some of it you can see from looking at the board right now, I think. The correlation, human being is rational being, right? A horse is perceptive being. Wood, uh, if it was living, it was living being. Now it's probably just, you know, a block of wood that's actually dead, right? Bear being. But there's more to the story than just that. And I'll, I'll show you as we, we go through it. So let's actually look at what Anselm says. I think this is very uh, important. It's a funny passage, too. So he says... This is at the very beginning of chapter 4. If someone considers the natures of things, the way things are, right, he cannot help realizing they are not of all equal dignity. Rather, some of them are on different and unequal levels. Okay, that's what we talked about here. For anyone who doubts that a horse is, by its very nature, better than wood, and that a human being is more excellent than a horse, should not even be called a human being. That's an interesting thing to say for several reasons. We're talking about the natures of things as those kinds of things. So horse as a horse, as a living thing. A horse is better than a block of wood. A human being is better than a horse. Notice that that's saying a horse has some value. A horse, as a living thing, has a relative value that is greater than that of just a block of wood or even, you know, a whole maybe forest of wood, but it's not as much as a human being. One human being might be said to outweigh a whole bunch of horses qua human being. Right? And, and so this implies that other measures that we use might not be getting at the reality of things, but, but just be dependent on other stuff. Now, why does he say that, that somebody who doesn't realize this, he says, somebody who doesn't grasp that a horse is by its very nature better than wood, that a human being is more excellent than a horse, should not be called a human being? Why not? Well, because a human being is rational. That is what makes the human being better than the horse. So a human being who can't realize that is in a certain way lacking in what is of the very nature of human beings, namely to be better than horses. What makes us better than horses? The very fact that we can realize, not just in a, in a sort of value response way or emotionally, but intellectually, that we are in fact better than, than horses. Um, the horse, I suppose, knows it's better than the hay that it eats, because it just eats the hay, right? It doesn't have to think about it. It does it more or less instinctually. Um, but there's this, this, this very important aspect here where Anselm is going to say, at this level, all of this is brought into perspective. So that doesn't happen at these lower levels. The horse doesn't worry about whether the human being is better than it, or whether it's better than the human being. It just horses around. It does horsey stuff because that's its nature. The human being, the human rational being, is able to grasp that. And so to fail to do that is in a certain sense to not necessarily lose one's humanity, but to, you might say short-circuit it, to put it in suspension. He says, um, since some natures are better than others, reason makes it no less obvious that one of them is so preeminent. That's where this is actually going. Um, now, in chapter 31, we have a much longer discussion, and this one is in terms of the word and, uh, you know, being's correspondence with the word. whole different topic that I don't want to get mired down in too much at this point. But he goes on and he says that... Um, Every intellect judges that natures that are in some way living 
are more excellent than those that are not living. Right? So there's a difference in quality there. Natures that perceive those that, that do not perceive. Right? Rational natures than that which lacks reason. So there's a difference in quality. Difference in, we might say, dignity or goodness. Is it a difference in being? He goes on and he says, um, yes, indeed. Uh, and he says that, here we go, when we're talking about the supreme nature, the supreme nature not merely exists but lives and perceives and is rational, of all existing things, what is in some way living is more like the supreme being, like being itself, than uh, what is in no way living. What in some way knows something, even through a bodily sense, is more like him than what perceives nothing at all. What is rational is more like him than what is not capable of reasoning. Then he says, by a similar argument, it's clear that certain natures exist more greatly or to a lesser degree than others. So the higher we go on it, it's not just a difference in quality, it's also a difference in being itself. Greater being at these levels. Notice that each of these levels incorporates the previous level before it. So that non-living being is not something that isn't there in living being. Living being just happens to transform non-living being into living being. Perceptive being is living being that is also perceptive and is thereby more being than just merely living. Like an oyster, for example. I don't know if oysters perceive and all, but you, you get the idea. Rational being, presumably, is a greater degree of being, according to Anselm, according to many other people, than merely perceptive animal being is. So we've got this very interesting thing set up. Then he goes on and he does a thought experiment. He says, imagine that we have a substance that lives and is capable of perception and is rational. So it's at the highest level, right? Now we start taking things away. We take away its rationality, then its ability to perceive, then its life, and finally the bare being, or bare existence, uh, nudum esse in, in uh, Latin uh, of his text, nudum, naked, esse, being. And what do we have there? He says, the substance is destroyed a little at a time, and it's gradually brought to exist less and less, and finally not to exist at all. So below this we have nothing. Nothingness. And nothingness isn't really anything, right? It's just non-being. If we go higher up, we find more and more being, and rational being, like human beings, are not actually at the top of the scale. What's at the top of the scale is supreme being, which incorporates all of this, but also in certain important respects, goes beyond it as well. And we don't need to necessarily worry about that. I just want to signal to you that this is not the very top level. What, what do we have that's similar to these? Well, like I said, we can map these onto each other, right? But you notice that this function of rationality, he says, every intellect, every rational being, he's not using intellect as something different than, than reason in this case, is able to take into account its difference to these other things. That is, again, at the core of what it means to be human, or if you like, because it's not just humans that are rational in Anselm's metaphysical scheme, to be rational being, to grasp the differences in this, to be able to understand that there are degrees of being. So that is a very important doctrine to keep in mind as you're approaching Anselm's monologian, and hopefully that clears it up a bit for you.